Fool, welcome back to the Indian Decision Podcast. I'm your host, D Palm. Follow me on Twitter at D Palm66. You can follow the show on Twitter as well at UDPod. If you're going to talk about the show on any of your various social medias, please use the hashtag UDPod so we can find you and say thanks for shouting us out. Uh, we're brought to you, of course, by the good folks at the MTR Network. Uh, One stop shop for entertainment news, movie news, video games, podcasts, politics, and of course, now. Sports. You can follow the entire network at the MTR Network on Twitter. Uh, make sure that you found us. You find all the other great shows that we have. When you find those shows, you subscribe in the iTunes Store, subscribe on Stitcher. That's a way. No matter when the next episode of the whatever you like drops, you get it to drop into your ears. When you're leaving, when you're subscribing, excuse me, make sure you leave a five star review. That way, your words can get heard on the air. We'll read them on the air. That's our policy here at the MTR Network, and we exercise it freely. All right, guys. Um, Big week in sports, and it's kind of the, the down week. It's the interesting, fun, not so much going on, because if you're honestly watching the Pro Bowl, you seriously have a gambling problem. Seek help. Um, but there are a lot of other stories. There was some NBA stuff. There was uh, LeBron. There was, there was the, the Bulls guys. And I promise I want to talk about all that, but we actually, we uh, pulled off an interview last week with the author of the GQ piece, The Concussion Diaries. If you don't know what that is, it's an amazing piece that went up. It's about all the young man's struggle with concussion. Concussions that ultimately lead to a suicide, and it's chronicled by the letters he left, kind of chronicling his spiral. So I was good enough, um, lucky enough to interview the author, Reed Forgrave, and that's what we're going to play for you guys next. Uh, it's a great interview. It's something to think about when we talk about all the sports. Uh, obviously, the link, the piece will be linked in the show notes so you guys can read along and uh, kind of get some more context for the interview you're about to hear. But it was a great time doing it. Big thanks to Reed for pulling it off. And uh, I'll be back to I guess, say bye at the end of this podcast. All right. All right, and tonight we've got with us a very special guest here on UDPod. Uh, we are, we are uh, joined by Reed Forgrave. Uh, he wrote the piece for GQ called The Concussion Diaries. Um, it ran on the GQ website on January 10th. It came to my attention about a week later from a former teammate of mine. It's been making the rounds against guys, but guys I know who I played with in college, guys I played with in high school, guys who I worked with when I worked in the league. And uh, it's an incredibly powerful piece. I'm going to link to it, obviously, in the show notes. Uh, Reed, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate you having me on to talk about a topic that, uh, frankly, it's a topic that makes football fans and, and Americans in general kind of uncomfortable uh, because there's there, there's just so much tied up in this topic. So I appreciate you being willing to dive in deep with all this stuff. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because the, the even the subheading of the of the piece itself, one high school f- football player's secret struggle with CTE. It's it's when we hear CTE now, and it's, of course it's tied to the the larger, I guess the the I'm using the term loosely blockbuster movie concussion that came out last year with Will Smith, it which didn't do well for lots of different reasons in the box office. But when we talk about CTE, generally you talk about it in the past tense. People say, oh, that guy suffered from CTE. It's a way, I think, honestly, an intellectual device that we as a public use to distance ourselves from it so that we can watch on Saturday, Sundays, and, of course, speaking here on Friday nights. How yeah. did this story come to you? Because in reading it, I was – it was remarkable how unremarkable all the details were. Right, right. I mean, he is – he's the average – he is your average kid from – He's from small town Iowa, but he's your average like midwestern rural slash small town kid who's slightly unhinged, who loves danger a little bit, uh, but he's ultimately just a fun loving guy that everyone loved. Uh, Zach, uh, he, he, as a journalist, I spend so much time looking for the poster children, right? Like right. you say, I want to write about, uh, I want about write about foreclosure foreclosures, and then you spend a week trying to find like the perfect uh, person to who had their house foreclosed upon. Uh, but I, the way I often find about it is uh, you know, the best stories tend to just come to you almost by accident. And that that's the case with, uh, with Zach. I'd obviously been paying attention to uh, CTE uh, and all the issues relating to it. I, I might've written a column or two when I was at foxsports.com, uh, but it's not something that I had ever really tried to chase. Uh, but uh, I was on, Christmas vacation last year, uh, visiting my family in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, his obituary was passed on to me uh, in the pa- newspaper I actually used to work for, the Des Moines Register. I lived in mm-hmm. Iowa for 10 years and uh, read this obituary. And there's a <clears throat> an entire paragraph in his obituary that basically says, 
Zach wants people to know about the disease that killed him. And he believes the meaning of his life is to bring more awareness to this disease. And, uh, these, uh, and they're referenced in the story, uh, but like these journals that Zach left right, behind, right, right. um, which is really the crux of the story, um, is that essentially this is a kid speaking to you from beyond the grave, uh, committed suicide at age 24 after having you know, six concussions, most of them in football that were diagnosed plus a bunch that were undiagnosed. Uh, but, uh, when, uh, when he leaves behind these journals, it's essentially like giving his parents and his family one an explanation. Hey, this a is why? Like, yeah, everyone wants to know why. But it also gives them, it gives them a charge going forward. It says, "Hey, this is how to make, you know, make my life meaningful. You guys go do it for me. Tell my story." Um, so, so in a way, look, this is an incredibly sad story. It's sad to get through. It's sad, it was sad to report, and, and, and none of that is even one one millionth of what the parents have gone through. Um, but in a way, these journals were a blessing of sorts. And that really made it easier for me as a reporter because the parents were so motivated to tell, you know, all the good stuff about Zach. And I think he comes across as a, as a charming, fun kid, like a kid that I wanted to hang out with and go drink some beers with yeah. in the story. Uh, but they also wanted to tell the awful parts, the most, you know, frankly, embarrassing parts, uh, uh, of stuff that he went through because that's that's all part of his his legacy which i you know honestly feel kind of called to uh to to, to keep it going well i gotta say I, I can't obviously speak for zach but speaking for a reader you did a really great job in communicating and when you got to hear the story you know i'm talking about you let the story breathe you let zach become a real person because as you mentioned you look for that perfect example that you want to use to speak to a larger issue but you never tried to make Zach perfect. You let him be imperfect. You let him be human. You made him real for the reader. And especially the inner splicing of his actual words really adds the impact and, and heft of the piece, in my opinion. Yeah, the editor that I uh, work with at GQ uh, on this story, Devin Gordon, I mean, hands down the best editor I've ever worked with in my life. And he, right, right from the beginning, was uh, when we were talking about just kind of like the formation of this story before before it was even you know even close to fully reported right uh, before I'd even seen the journals when we were talking about this it was like hey the writing needs to be spare uh, it, you you need to let Zach's voice uh, be the driver of the story and sometimes like it sounds like it's easy let the story tell itself get out of the way <laughs> as a writer but uh, <laughs> most writers have, including myself have a really tough time doing that. Uh, so I, I, I do think what's what's spooky and haunting about this story is how you get the sense that Zach is speaking directly to you. Right. And uh, at the bottom of the story, we have about a 12 minute documentary and it's called Listen to Zach. And his, that's what his mom said in this part of the documentary. It's basically like, hey, parents of football players, listen to Zach. Pay, att pay attention to this. That doesn't mean stop playing football necessarily, although that is the reaction that I've gotten from plenty of people. Right. Uh, but it does mean, like, be aware of this. I, I think the word awareness is such a vague word, and it's thrown out <laughs> there. Like, oh, we need to bring awareness to the cause. You know, wearing a T-shirt is going to bring awareness, whatever. Uh, but, like, I, I do think with CTE, with concussions in football, and with a, a culture that is so ingrained, this macho play through the pain lift up the, the the warrior who who throws his body on the line um awareness is actually a huge part of this that like hey if you think your head's messed up i don't care if it's the fourth quarter and your team's driving and you're down four points like take yourself out because 20 years from now you might be looking back at that moment and being like oh that was the time that i went back in right after getting a concussion and that's when things got really bad um yeah so so yeah the, the word awareness i I think is overused as, uh, but but I do think in Zach's case, it is uh, it is a big part of you know what his legacy hopefully will become. And it goes beyond awareness. I, I know that I agree with you that awareness becomes kind of a catch-all buzzword, but this is him keeping a journal isn't awareness. That's an active that's an active participant. That's someone who, and that's almost the scariest part for me as someone who played football for so long. Um, you watch him realize what's happening to him. Yeah, he, and. And while you're reading it, and for me, I'm I'm, I'm a reader. I'm, I'm a voracious reader. I love books. This piece took me a solid three hours to get through. Because every other sentence, I was like, well, that 
I didn't recognize that in myself or a teammate or an uh, opponent. Yeah, I, I, mean, I remember those moments. Or I've seen them on film. Maybe I don't remember them, but I've seen them on film. Right, right. And I mean, that is the, mo- the most remarkable part about Zach's journals. You know, I, I kind of separate these into two different things. There's his journals, which is him essentially writing about, like, losing his mind in real time, very much like a dear diary type thing. And then he also kind of has this, what I call his autobiography, like a 50 page. This is my history of playing football and getting concussions and what football meant to me. Um, and it goes into some of his struggles, but, uh, what's, what's remarkable reading through these is his sense of self-awareness. Um, and the fact that he had the awareness to record it because like, I, th- I, I, I get the sense, and you know, it's, in retrospect, it's easy to say these things, but it's almost like you get the sense that this was this is what he was planning. That Zach was like, okay, people are going to be out there reading my story. I need them to know all these things. Right. Um, but yeah, his look, he's not self aware throughout this thing. Like I think that's one of the issues with CTEs. These massive uh, uh, emotional, you're going back and forth. There are times swings. That, yeah. Oh, he's all over the place. Uh, and there are times that he says. Uh, basically, I, I hate football. I was I wish I never played. Uh, I was following my dad, and there was so much pressure on me to do this, blah, blah, blah. And then there are other times where he, where, where he says, you know, two pages later, I, I, I love football. Don't blame yourself. Don't blame football. Uh, if I could do it all over, um, I, I'd do the exact same thing. And I do think, in a way, like, you don't think that those two thoughts can coexist right. in time. But in a way, it kind of goes into how we as football fans, and I'm I'm not the world's biggest football fan, but I'm pretty big. Like, I've watched every single NFL playoff game yeah. uh, over the past few weeks. Um, and that's saying a lot because they have not been good football games. No, they have not. <laughs> all of them, but I've caught at least glimpses of all of them. Um, but, like, I think these thoughts coexist in our minds. Like, when people say, uh, so many people who are, you know, like, what I say is I'm like, I'm not going to let my two young sons play football. I'm scared of football. Um, I'm scared of what it could do to them. And yet I watch football. I love football. I get out there. I go to a Minnesota Vikings game. I was at the opening game for West Bank Stadium against the Packers early this year in September. And I was, you know, I was crunk and I was rowdy and I was getting into it. Like I'm getting into every game, every playoff game. I, uh, it is weird how I think there's some hypocrisy to it. Definitely. Uh, I, I, I'm referring to myself as a hypocrite oh, there. Oh, me too. Because, like, yeah, we, we all know that it's obviously a violent sport, and it's it's clearly been proven to be a dangerous sport, but we still love it. And I'm not sure uh, – maybe that's just part of being human, is that we're able to have two pretty polar opposite views in our mind and yet still be able to morally get through it. Yeah, so we're coming off last week's episode. I had my dad on who played <coughs> football. I played college football, and we were on the podcast celebrating the Falcons win. Mm-hmm. It's it's a huge moment for us for Atlanta fans through and through. But at the same time, I, I have this interview with you, and I have to think back. And So this two winters ago, I was putting Christmas presents in my car, and I locked my keys in my car at lunch at work. And for most people, that's just a, an absent-minded thing to do. For me, it was, oh, God, is that a sign? Yeah. And unless and like I had to reach out to friends who played in the NFL, be like, because people who don't have that specter, they really kind of say you're just being weird and paranoid. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, maybe I am. I hope I am. I'd prefer to be weird and paranoid than to think I'm losing it. I had drinks with Junior Seau two months before he killed himself. Like I played line at a one double A school that did not prioritize football. It's an Ivy League nerd school where the football team was something you might do on a Saturday if it was nice and if you felt like riding the bus a hundred blocks. <laughs> but see, uh, my junior year against Harvard, we threw a pick. I'm, I've told the story on the podcast. I'm covering the pass, and my next clear memory is being yelled at on the bench by my O-line coach. I turn to my left tackle. I say, what did I miss? And I said, what happened? He goes, you missed a block on draw, whatever it was. And he said, I said, my last clear memory was the pick. He goes, that was two series ago. And I said we didn't have this conversation. Wow, man! I mean, and and, and that's it's all. First of all, it's all too common, right? Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure you've talked to tons of players who've had similar experiences. And what what year did you graduate uh, from college? I'm class of '07. So, like back then, 
that was, I mean, it was a thing. You knew it was a thing, but I don't think anyone really took it seriously. I mean, look, no. if you look at Zach Easter, he graduated high school in 2010, and it's right. kind of like that's the last generation of, of kids who who can say they didn't know. They can plead ignorance, and yeah. and uh, I, now I I I mean maybe I'm wrong, but like if that if that had happened now, uh, you might have uh, taken a pause. And, and I definitely would as a 31 year old man, but it's interesting to, to see it happen with these kids because like you mentioned, it's not just the, I want to play football because it's fun. It's the indoctrination of the entire culture that says a week one says that they can't go. But at the same time, when I was playing at Columbia, um, a young man who he was this captain at Penn. He had just won Ivy league player of the week before the week before against believe against Harvard. And two days before he played us, he killed himself in his dorm room. I remember reading about this. And then it happened again at UPenn uh, three years later, I believe, in 2010. You watch, and, they, and, like, and I tell people, people say that, I, I say that, and they don't really, it doesn't connect, but I, I, I can't impress. These are not schools that prioritize athletics. So there, there, there's, there's one section of this story that I'm curious how it resonates with you. Okay. And it was when I was talking with, Zach's Zach Easter's high school coach, yeah. Eric Clu- Kluver, nice dude, loves football. And football kind of defines who he is, uh, and not not just like hey, we score more points than the other team, but he right. believes football. There's a lot of good to come from football, and, and I and believe there told, is. And he told me about standing over Zach's casket and thinking, and, and he actually had had one of his high school players had had and nearly died uh, from a from a hit to the head, was permanently messed up from it. Just a, it was one of Zach's teammates. It was just like uh, probably in 2008 this happened. Right. right. Uh, and then when he was actually playing high school football 30 years ago, uh, one of his friends uh, suffered a hit to the head. I think he had bleeding on the brain and was he didn't die immediately, but was affected by it and 10 or 15 years ago died from it. Um, and what he said standing over this casket is like, when is enough enough? When, when will I tell myself? That, that, that this sport isn't worth it. And he had really thought about this. And I think what he, what he decided, I, I think after a lot of soul, soul searching was that there's more good that comes from football than there is bad. Uh, and I'm curious, uh, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you read that part in the story and yeah. I'm sure that at least, you know, pinged around your brain a little bit. Like, what do you think? Well, it's that, interesting that's what it comes down to, you know, yeah, it's, it's come down to, cause I was, I had, like I mentioned you uh, before we started recording, I had my running back on our show a couple weeks ago. One of my best friends is going to be groomsman in my wedding this, this fall. And we had a very frank and open conversation about football and about what it had done for us. And I think he and I both said and agreed, and we landed on the place of, would you do it again? I think so. Yeah. Knowing what you're now, I think so. But it's hard to say this far divorce, like I said, from the indoctrination, from, from being involved. I've lived it as a business. So it's, I have a very different relationship with football than I did at 18, 19, 20. At the same time, my father, who did play, didn't let me play until I was 10. Mm-hmm. Especially in the South, in Atlanta, kids are playing at 5, 6. These, I was not allowed to play until 10 because even my dad then, without any signs, was like, it's not, you're not, your body's not ready for it. Mm-hmm. And so I asked, my, I asked my running back, Krishan, I said, he has a son now. His son is four. I said, will you let your son play football? He says, I do not know. And I don't, and I haven't reached that point. And I think he actually landed on a no and said, if he really wants to, when he's in high school, we will have a long conversation about it. Yeah. We will, yeah. because I think that's the most important thing. And I, and I was fortunate to have my dad on last week and we talked about this situation in Oregon and how these players have been taught and told the, the toughness thing so long and yeah. also been told that there's no one that has your back because we can we paint we we proselytize these coaches and say oh they're 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 here for the development of these young men particularly the college ranks. They're really, I mean are they and, and I hate to sound that cynical, but you make more money if I get on the field. Yeah, yeah. So it behooves you to make sure I'm on the field. And if the athletic training staff wants to keep their jobs, they better keep me on the field too. Everyone's invested in me being on the field, including me, the player. Mm-hmm. There's no one – There's and that's really my main thing. There's been no advocate, particularly at the lower levels, for these kids. There's been no one – and if you don't have that support structure or someone that you know you can trust, someone who's mentoring you maybe outside the team, you don't know that you can say, I can't do this anymore. 
Yeah, it's like it's like the the mentality that we value in a great football player is play, <laughs> like, play through the pain, be a warrior, and like frankly, like that's a that's something that I value in a man. I mean, I have, right. a, I have a four year old son, and I am to some he cries a lot, and he's like, he, he can be a whiner, and I'm kind of trying to teach him, you know, look me in the eyes when you talk, be a man, stop crying. Um, th- these are all lessons that I do think you can learn from football, but that same mentality that we say. We love this player because X, Y, Z. It's that same mentality that leads a guy to play through some things that he should never, ever be playing through. Hell, it leads the same guy to drive drunk because he thinks he's invincible because yeah. he can do it. And, and and I think you're 100% right. When I got to school, they asked me point blank how many concussions that I ever had. And at the time, and to this day, I've had zero diagnosed concussions to this day. But they did ask me, how many stingers did you get in high school? And I looked them in the eye and said, "What do you mean a game?" <laughs> Jeez, and man. They, and they and they they looked at me with a face that said that was the wrong answer. So then I turned it into a joke. I said, "Oh no, you may be through your season." Meanwhile, I, a stinger, like, come on, that was yeah. that was my life in high school. I was, what are you, my left arm was an option, like it would it would work sometimes, and it wouldn't. I I know for a fact I have nerve damage. Uh, my senior year of wrestling, I was a wrestler in high school too. But you can watch after I shake hands the first period, I can't use my left arm. And it's something that, yeah, they, they had the baseline concussion test, but at the same time, you had upperclassmen saying, bomb the baseline, that way they can't take you out of the game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Zach Easter, the kid I wrote about, uh, mm-hmm. is talking about, I, you know, he, 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 he admits in his journals, I went and lied to the doctor because I wanted to play. That's what we want to do. We want to play. Like, I, I get that. Yeah, we all get it. We're competitors. And, and probably... One of one of the things that uh, Zach's family is trying to do in the state of Iowa, and then hopefully bring to a federal level, is to like ensure. And this seems like very common sense legislation, but like mandated athletic trainer at every varsity game for concu- uh, I'm sorry for a contact sport uh, that is trained in concussions, uh, which seems like a uh, <laughs> how do we get no this kid, far without that? Like like, like yeah, I could find. Uh, uh, like like 99 senators who'd sponsor that legislation it's a, it's such a winner but i mean it it takes money you know and it takes uh and frankly like talking to the train zach's trainer who was on the sidelines for all of his or not all of his concussions but several of them uh she spoke about being a pretty unwelcome presence uh it's like it's like you're kind of like the ombudsman for a newspaper where <laughs> they're the call out people for for doing something bad. Your internal uh, affairs in a police procedural. Exactly. <laughs> no one really wants that guy to come there. So there's this like necessary tension that has to go on there. So, uh, yeah, it's, a. Uh, I I mean, to me, look, there, there, there has to be medical research done about this. And we're decades off, uh, from the right. doctor I've spoken to, uh, there needs to be tons of money that's tossed into the research side of it. There, it's an equipment question. Uh, although I'd, I tend to wonder if uh, if safer helmets are really going to stop concussions, or if they might actually increase them inadvertently. Um, it's a you know legislative question, but I, I think ultimately it's a culture question, and culture can be a really really tough thing uh, to change because it's so amorphous and intangible. Right? How do you put your finger on something to change it? I got to ask: Is the Easter's that legislation? That that it seems so common sense. I, I I'm so overwhelmed and happy hearing that, but I gotta ask, and this is probably maybe probably a little unfair for you to speak of, for the culture and the sport. Is there a way to build a safe cigarette here? Because it feels like no matter what we do, we're smoking. Yeah, I mean, I I gotta be honest. I I I, I think the and this is something I wrote in the story. Like, there's there's really no solution here. At least there certainly isn't an easy solution or an obvious one. Um. Football's a violent sport. If we turn it into flag football, who's going to play that? that is, right. It's not fun. It's not fun to watch. It's not fun to play. Like even when I would, you know, I'm 37 now, but as recently as 10 years ago, I'd go out in November, December, and go play football with with my buddies, and I'd always be the guy to be like, "Yeah, we're playing tackle, man. We're playing tackle." We sometimes play tackle, sometimes wouldn't. Um, right. But like, that's what we love about this sport. And like, here's the other question. Let's say. I do think this is an existential question for football and for the NFL, um, ultimately, like when it comes down to it. When you have parents saying, I'm not letting my kid play, that's an existential question. Let's say a generation or, or two from now, football becomes either goes away or I think you know, more likely becomes boxing, becomes a 
niche sport that's played by you know poor kids who are looking for a lottery ticket. Right. Um, even if that happens, isn't there going to be another sport that comes around? Like, isn't this kind of just human nature that we love controlled exhibitions of violence? And a little bigger, faster, violence? stronger, and exactly, yeah. And it's you know you know why people don't watch Olympic boxing, <laughs> and it's and I I I think they changed it for 2016. But I was covering the 2012 Olympics. I went to a few boxing, uh, a few days of boxing and taekwondo. I think and. They had so much gear on them that it was boring to watch. And you're just like, right. I don't want to watch this. I want to see someone get his ass kicked. It's it's uh, that threat of violence that that really draws us to these things. And I think you're 100% right. But I got to ask, because when I read this story, I was like, well, this is going to change the world. This is the one. This is the, <laughs> the inassailable. And the more I talk to people, people who are interested in this topic, the more I was like, oh, you send that to me. Like, wait, you haven't read it yet? How, how have you not read This is something we both care about. How have you not – it's interesting to see how football lifers, of which I consider myself one, kind of position themselves with the story because, and stories like it, because this is not, you know, not to step on you here, this is not the first time we've heard this story. Right. But it is continuing to be where people say, oh, that's a one instance, or or, or they'll take the, the ultimate aggressive approach of, why are you trying to kill our sport? Yeah, that's such a, like, like that is actually like the one the one response to this that gets me, and I actually haven't gotten it that much. Good. Uh, I was about I to think, ask if that had come. I think because it is such a dramatic story about a sympathetic character that if, if that's your reaction to it, uh, you, you're kind of an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, like, uh, I think we're really good at compartmentalizing, right? Like, just as humans. Uh, I, I, I read Orson Scott Card. And I think his stances on things are abhorrent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, exactly. Like plenty of evangelical Christians voted for Donald Trump, you know, and uh, look, I don't I know this probably isn't the place for a political. It is. No, it's you're fine. It's fine. But it's uh, but, but <laughs> it is. We're able to say, look, what, what this guy has kind of stood for, you know, for a lot of his life is, you know, goes against our very basic values as evangelical Christians. and. uh and yet we can compartmentalize that and say, hey, it's better for our movement and better for we believe the United States if we you know, vote for this guy. Um, man, I think this is just probably part of the compli being complicated modern day humans who have so much information thrown at them and so many things that they can like or dislike that you can both read Zach's story and feel, you know what, football probably isn't good for humanity. Um, although I'm, I'm not sure I'm at that point. Right. Uh, it's like a force sure. and trees thing. Like it, and it sucks because the, the question you lead yourself down and you, it, I'm sure you ultimately and, uh, landed on this is, well, what's what, how many kids have to, like, what's the number where I stop watching? Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, sure. it's, it, you, you face with this really real level of hypocrisy because after this podcast, I'm going to record our Super Bowl preview. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I was talking to my friends from Georgia when Chris Conley took that hit against the Steelers two weeks ago, and got back in after one play. I was like, "Well, where's the independent concussion?" I, I, I'll tell you right now, a concussion test. Excuse me, takes Wait, longer are, than are one play. Are you talking about the Matt Moore hit? Oh my goodness, that one. So, so I kind of, not that anyone cares when I when I tweet, but I, I kind of like <laughs> went wild on Twitter, being like, I can't believe. That, that 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 the NFL would penalize it with a you know 15 yard roughing the passer penalty that was offset moments later by a Dolphins running back who shoved a guy got an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty and it's basically saying those two things are equal like right. if we're talking about changing the culture I'll tell you how the culture changes Bud Dupree has that hit on Matt Moore and immediately well you know go ahead and review it sure. But like, doesn't matter if it's uh, you know premeditated or not. It happened. Gets kicked out of the game immediately. Like that's I think what the NFL's role should be in changing the culture. And people get mad about it. Yeah. Donald Trump about we'll talk about sissifying the national sport. And plenty of other people will. And like, there, there's some truth in it. Like that that does kind of take away some of the the hard ass nature of football. But there are hits to the head, especially ones like that. I, I think it just should be considered so far beyond the pale that it's not even a question. 
Yeah. Uh, Those hits, I think, are the exceptions, the ones that everyone can agree on. For me, it's almost having being very much self-interested in playing offensive line. Mm-hmm. It's those mm-hmm. micro hits. It's the hits that, that yeah. don't register, that don't make highlight reels. And it's the reason why you've seen youth football numbers are dropping across the country. I think that the NFL is going to reach a tipping point where something has to be done. You've seen it with kickoffs being moved. You've seen it with, which actually is somehow related in more returns because uh, God help them, how fo- our football coaches are determined to get you to hit. <laughs> um, but I, I really just appreciate you taking the time. And before we get out of here, I do want to ask, because like I said, we are a DIY operation here. Any advice for aspiring writers to try to find their voice? To, because what you've done here is you've presented a case, you've presented something that's somewhat, or in certain circles, highly controversial, but you've done it in such a way that it's hard for people to take the opposite side, the pro-dead children angle. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so I, I just want, do you have any advice for our listeners who might be struggling with finding their voice in writing or finding their place in the in, in the sphere that is becomes more and more populated every day? You know, I, I think in modern media 2017 blogosphere and uh you know all the controversies that are out there people love to you know what's jim rome saying have a take and don't suck you know (laughs) gotta have a take uh i think that's look i've uh, when i was at foxsports.com for five years i did plenty of uh plenty of hot takes i mean hot takes that i believed in i never wrote anything that i didn't believe um, but I think there's so much power, like my training in the newspaper world and then now in the magazine world is in narrative journalism. And I think, uh, people today want their view out there and there's so much power in just getting out of the way of the story. I don't think I ever, in this story about Zach Easter, uh, I don't really like editorialize, uh, until the next to last section. And right. it's like a pretty subtle editorializing where you're saying, Hey, there really you, you drew difference. logical conclusions from everything that have been that have been shown. Yeah, but like there's so much power you know, with the right story. Um, but there's right. so much power in just stepping out of the way, taking your ego out of it, letting the story tell itself. And and, and you know, people throw away that. I'm sorry, throw around that term quite a bit. Letting let a story tell itself. It's not as easy as it sounds because removing yourself from it uh, can be tough. Like like whether it's a political story. Or whether it's uh, you know a narrative, a, you know a gut wrenching narrative like this. So, the power the power of human story. I, I look like what do they always say? Like a million is a statistic and one is a tragedy. Right. Um, a million deaths is a statistic. One one death is a tragedy. Like when do people start pay, paying attention to uh, the Syrian refugee crisis? Was it when we get all these AP stories about like the tens of thousands of people who are who are dying or being displaced? No, it was when. You get that one picture of a what a four year old kid right. it absolutely breaks your heart, and I think it's the same thing with this. Like, make sure it's the right story that you're doing it about. Like, I I could tell you so many times where I've tried to make the poster child story out of someone that isn't the real poster child, and uh, sometimes I catch myself, sometimes I don't. And I, I write a story that doesn't ring true and frankly d- doesn't resonate. But uh, I, I do think the importance of just telling other people's stories instead of being so focused on uh, so inward focused is uh, a lot of what's look, it's out there, right? Like right. GQ, all, there's so many magazines, plenty of websites. Vice does an incredible job doing it. But like, I feel like we're moving much, especially in sports media, much toward the, uh, toward the hot take. And I think there, that, that sort of has limited worth, um, you know, long-term worth in the world. I couldn't agree more. Reed, again, thank you for coming on. Uh, you guys can follow him on Twitter, at Reed Forgrave. I will be linking his piece in the show notes. Um, it is called uh, Concussion Diaries, and it ran on GQ.com. Um, again, thanks for coming on. We remain here at UD Pod, pro football, but if we can be pro football and still be educated about it, I think that's the best way to go. Reed, thanks for taking the time, and uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah, man, couldn't agree more, and thanks for having me. All right. One more time, a big thanks to Reed for doing the uh, interview with us. I had a great time talking to him about the piece and about the the larger issues surrounding football. And uh, again, like I said, we're not pro fo- we're not anti football at all here. We're just pro safer football, and let's get it as safe as we can so people don't have to die for us to be entertained. Uh, this has been. Uh, an, a fun episode because I like this interview and I think that's very important but 
You may be saying, I want to hear my news. I want to hear my Super Bowl preview. Have no fear. That's all coming up this week. I've done something really cool with the Super Bowl preview. You can hear my voice and my opinions, but also the predictions of some voices you've heard on this show and other ones around the Internet. Uh, I'm very excited and proud to bring that to you guys later this week, probably running Wednesday or Thursday, just in time for you to get those final bets in to make sure you make a little bit of money on Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, again, make sure you, when, now that you found the show, you subscribe in the iTunes store. That way you don't miss any more episodes ever again. Again, when you're subscribed and leave a five star review to make sure that we know that someone's listening, you may you'll get all your words read in the air, especially if they're nice, if they're mean. I mean, I'll still read them, but I won't feel as good about it. And uh, if you have anything else you want to tell the show, you can email the show at udpodcast at gmail.com. Follow the show on Twitter at udpod. Follow the network on Twitter at the MTR network. Follow me on Twitter. I'm Deep Palm at Deep Palm66. That was your show. This is your outro. See you guys later.